Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome uh, to our presentation um, today. So my name is Christoph. I'm a CEO and co-founder of ScaleUp. And uh, with me, I have uh, Frank. He's our uh, um, COO at ScaleUp, uh, responsible for all operations in our data centers. And uh, also within the presentation, it's John Leong of Intel, and he will uh, focus a bit more on, on Redfish doing this presentation. So it will be a combined uh, presentation uh, focusing quite a bit on the Open Compute project. And from our side, it will be a bit more focused on what we at ScaleUp did to build a, a more sustainable uh, OpenStack cloud uh, using OCP platforms. So a quick background on who we are. So we are a managed hosting company um, and co-location provider based in Hamburg and here in Berlin. We have uh, seven data center sites here in Germany and uh, we also operate OpenStack-based clouds for uh, an infrastructure as a service offering. Um, and additionally, on top of our OpenStack infrastructure, there's also a managed Kubernetes uh, platform. We are uh, a small team. Um, we are less than 20 people at this point, uh, and we are fully focused on open source. Um, and uh, for a couple of years, we are also more and more focused on becoming more sustainable. Um, and this is uh, in regards to everything we do uh, in our company. It's uh, not only about uh, energy efficiency and things like that, but we are trying to reduce our carbon footprint uh, with everything that we do. Um, and so this somewhat led to, to this project that we will be talking about today. So uh, the question is why build a cloud with open hardware and to be quite honest, um, I didn't really know uh, what open hardware was uh, two years ago. Um, so in essence, a, a good friend approached me and, and asked me whether I would be interested in acquiring some Facebook servers. And I was like, Facebook servers? I, well, sure, they must use some servers, but I wasn't aware that there is like a typical Facebook server. So um, but it certainly uh, got my attention um, and I went uh, onto Google and um, found out that that might actually be uh, quite interesting for us. Um, so, um, well, we basically went ahead and first of all, uh, we ordered just a, a small testing setup with just uh, a couple of servers um, just to, to, to get a feel of it. And um, well, during my uh, search on, on, on Google and the likes, I, I find out, found out that there's uh, potentially uh, a very interesting aspect for us in, in using those OCP servers because um, there, there was lots of talk about, uh, besides many other benefits, that they will be much more energy efficient than like a traditional 19-inch based um, server. So, um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm the CEO, so I can do anything I like. Uh, so I just went ahead and ordered two full racks of those servers and figured, let's just give it a try. And uh, I, I told Frank, our CEO, um, that I just ordered uh, two full racks of servers for a lot of money. Um, and, um, well, we went ahead and, and tried those out. Um, what's also important uh, with this, so we didn't buy new OCP gear, gear, it was like refurbished servers, so, so they actually came from some Facebook data center somewhere, I don't know where, but they came from Facebook. And so this really also helps us to reduce our, our uh, scope three emissions, and for those of you who don't know about uh, those, those types of emissions, so there's scope one, two, and three. Scope one is essentially, um, if you drive your car and the fuel you use is scope one, scope two is when you, when, when you run your data center and the energy you put in into something and scope three emissions are the emissions that went into actually building the server. So by using a server that was previously used, that drastically reduces our 
type uh, scope three emissions. Um, so that's actually a very interesting aspect in using um, those uh, refurbished OCP servers. So I think uh, John had a presentation yesterday. Well, no, it was Steve, actually. Uh, um, Steve from uh, the uh, Open Compute Foundation had a presentation on Tuesday where you also briefly talked about some of the aspects uh, of uh, open hardware and OCP, and I won't get into too much detail unless you have questions uh, later on. But so, well, one of the main benefits supposedly is the energy efficiency of OCP. So what you see on your uh, right-hand side is uh, some uh, uh, graphs and statistics from uh, SK Telecom, so it's a telecom provider based in uh, Korea. And so they did uh, uh, like a, a test in a real data center and a real co-location data center where they took a traditional 19-inch server and an OCP server and they compared how much more efficient the uh, OCP server is running compared to a traditional server. So you see two different uh, workloads, uh, the upper one being, well, server doing nothing, being idle. And there you actually, so the lower line is, is the OCP one, uh, you actually have up to 50% more efficiency uh, in, in, in using those servers. Um, if you run it at 100%, it, it goes down to about 19%, and that's somewhat in the range that, that I also found. So 15 to 20% seems to be something realistic. Um, so we basically did those tests ourselves. Um, we just got one of our regular Dell servers. We're using Dell servers all over the place. Um, it had the exact same configuration as the OCP server, same CPUs, same amount of memory, same disks, everything the same. Um, and we did uh, some synthetic benchmarks on those machines. And those are the results that we got. And so that basically translates to exactly what uh, SK Telecom also, also did. And uh, while well, being based in Germany, saving 15 to 20 percent on the energy bill is uh, is interesting. Nowadays, it's probably interesting for for anyone in Europe, right? Um, but uh, that really uh, helps us. Well, first of all, to save costs, but also to to being more uh, sustainable. Um, we did some additional tests after that. Um, so in uh, the one data center where we're currently running this uh, stuff, there, uh, there's no cold aisle containment yet. Uh, so we did some testing with cold aisle containment for those OCP racks. Um, but well, the, the essence of, of those tests is that cold aisle containment for OCP does not bring uh, a large benefit. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, those open compute servers and the open compute hardware can be run at much higher temperatures to begin with. So, um, keeping your cold aisle contained in the in, uh, cold air contained in the cold aisle doesn't pose such a such a such a large benefit here. So, just uh, uh, some some stuff on on the basic setup. So, the the types of nodes that we are using. Um, so, well, we run uh, OpenStack and Ceph. Um, on it, so we have some OpenStack servers, um, uh, all with uh, 25 gigabit Ethernet backend. Uh, the net network stack is, is also fully OCP, so we're using the Facebook wedge switches, uh, 100G switches for, uh, and, and the spine leaf architecture. And for the Ceph nodes, we're also using OCP servers, um, fully flash, so only NVMe drives in those servers, just to give you an overview, and that's uh, a picture of one of those OCP servers. So, um, certainly uh, running OCP is nothing special for someone like Facebook or, I don't know, all, all the big hyperscalers out there. Uh, for a smaller provider and a traditional data center, it does pose its challenges. Um, so one of the first uh, issues um, that we discovered, besides the fact that you don't get the servers uh, packed like you're used to, where you get one package per server, you get basically a full rack and it's already ready um, with all servers in it. Um, one of the 
The first thing that we had an issue with was that uh, OCP racks expect to get the power from the top of the rack. Well, we have a traditional data center, we have raised floor, and power is beneath the raised floor, so it's kind of uh, not ideal. So we actually, well, we went on Amazon and ordered some extra cables to <laughs> get the power up to the top of the rack. Um, another thing that we discovered um, was that at least with the uh, OCP server generation that we used, uh, the board management controller was very basic. I mean, I told you that we use Dell servers, so we're used to the full iDRAC experience. And, well, the experience of that very raw and basic BMC was uh, not what we were expecting. Um, in our traditional setups, we have a dedicated IPI network, so we have dedicated interface just doing IPMI. There's certainly um, the possibility to have that on OCP, but um, we learned the hard way that there are slight variations on how the actual manufacturer builds out those OCP servers, and even though there is a possibility to have an IPMI interface, that does not mean that you will have that interface on your server. So our servers didn't have that, so we had to, um, well, basically put it on the existing uh, network stack somehow. And another challenge that we faced was, um, well, now that you don't have any traditional servers anymore, you just have uh, a full uh, rack um, with servers that don't even have space to put like a, a name tag on them anymore. Um, you have to also rethink your deployment methods and, and how you actually go about into uh, installing OpenStack, installing Ceph and, and, and all the likes. So uh, we had to decide on, on a way on how to, how to do that. And Frank will tell you a bit more about that. Well, yes, I think uh, running out of time. Um, well, we uh, thought about using OpenStack Caller. Well, first let me put it like this. We are, in, uh, we are using OpenStack since 10 years about right now, we started with Grizzly. Uh, we, used, uh, we started with a Swift installation short after we had our first complete cloud. And so we're not new to the business. I'm pretty old, so I was using Puppet a lot, but uh, this didn't seem to be a choice within, with a newer cloud. So we, it was pretty, pretty soon sure that we, we had to use Ansible any, anyhow. We ha uh, luckily, we have a new colleague who's really smart with Ansible, and um, this was just yeah, yeah, very lucky for the for, for us. Well, I, I worked with Kala before. We had an uh, Edge Cloud set up with Kala uh, for a Vietnamese customers some years ago, and um, one of our uh, well, we are small company, so we have a. Uh, a certain portfolio. We customize cloud business uh, very much uh, towards our customers and uh, customization with containers means you need uh, perfect working CI, CD uh, in your company to, to be able to uh, build new containers and, and, and put them on the line as soon as, as fast as you need them. And uh, this is an extra level of com 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 complicity which we uh, avoided. So we decided against color this time. And uh, we were using Open Ansible, but uh, we ran into the next problem, which is uh, with Open Stack Ansible, uh, you have hard coded uh, variables, variables like uh, Keystone or Newton or it's always. Keystone uh, underscore or Neutron underscore or, and these are uh, this, 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 you, you you cannot use one inventory for multiple clouds. This is because it, it, you will have this this Keystone all group and it's it's uh, uh, you have all 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 Keystone controller instances of all clouds in in in, in that group. So you have to uh, either use multi multiple instances of the inventory, or um, you have to change this uh, uh, this all group, this Keystone all, Neutron all, whatever group. 
Uh, we were in contact with the Keystone developers and uh, they had some good arguments against uh, changing this. We are still in contact. We will keep in contact, but uh, we decided to go to just, uh, um, yeah, what we finally do is, uh, we, we, with heavy usage of the, of the uh, original OpenStack Ansible roads, uh, we, we built a layer in, on top uh, so that we can use one inventory for, for all the clouds. Um, yeah, and so we, 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 we succeeded in, in, in building our cloud and, and we are now able to just reproduce this in, 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 on, uh, at the other locations of our company. I think, uh, oh yeah, you have the description of this one on that side. Yeah. I, I would be around to, uh, to uh, answer any, any technical questions afterwards. I think it's no use to go deeper in detail right now. Thank you. Okay, so um, to, to sum it up and give some more time to, to John to talk uh, about Redfish, which we would have loved to use if our servers were, would support it. Um, so uh, we believe that um, Using OCP hardware um, is, uh, is also interesting for smaller operators. So, I mean, for sure, if, if you're a very large hyperscale-like uh, operator, sure, uh, OCP is probably any, anyhow the way to go. But uh, I think we kind of proved that even for, for a smaller operator and a smaller company, it can be possible to adopt OCP. I mean, there's still a few challenges here and there. I, had a conversation um, just last week uh, with with the foundation, and there's certainly a few things that could be improved for for smaller and medium-sized enterprises to uh, to make it more easy for them to use OCP as well. But it can be used, and and I think um, going down this road, uh, well, basically adding finally adding open hardware to your open software, which like and everyone is using, uh, is certainly uh, the way to go. And for us, it also made, us, made it possible to, to become uh, much more sustainable in, uh, in running this infrastructure. So I, I can only highly encourage uh, anyone to, to take a look at OCP um, and don't be afraid uh, of the first challenges. Uh, once it's running, it's running. So, um, and it's still the same server inside. So, um, well, with that, uh, uh, I'm going to say thank you and uh, hand over to, to John. Okay. This page down. Oh, good thing. Good. Wait, if I need to go back. Okay. So, um, I'm going to do a, a quick uh, uh, discussion of OCP platforms. Um, and first, I'll tell you exactly. Okay, so uh, one, one of the challenges of, of integrating OCP hardware into is deployment is manageability. And in my discussion with, with Chris Hoffley was, oh, well, you have old generation for OCP, it won't work for you, uh, but this is the way we're gonna go. And I think in our further discussions, we'll try to figure out a way of getting newer OCP hardware for them to, to rerun this test with, with the latest hardware. So um, I uh, represent Intel at OCP. Uh, and I am the uh, representative to the hardware management project. So the first thing about OCP, um, for those who weren't at the uh, presentation uh, two days ago, is that OCP and what exactly is open, open compute platforms, projects? Um, it's basically, it was founded on, on, on envy and jealousy of open source. It was the, um, they were looking at the innovation of the community within open source of being able to have things out in the open and built and improved. And they said, how do we bring this type of community innovation to hardware? And the way you do it is you push hardware designs out into the open, you allow people to take that hardware design, improve it, and then contribute it back to that hardware community. So that's what OCP does. And it's out of that type of innovation that you get platforms with reduced uh, power consumption because that's the way the community wanted to, to take the platforms. 
So within the uh, hardware management project, when I went in, uh, it was uh, as uh, someone who brought in, in Redfish. So Redfish was a, a protocol layer definition. And I went into OCP and I told them, you know, you, you really have a whole lot of platforms. You have, you have HPC platforms, you have storage platforms, you have network platforms, you have server platforms. Uh, your problem is going to be uh, you cannot have a different manageability interface for each one of them. You should have a consistent one, a single one. Um, and everyone who, who um, uses that interface should be able to get some base set of functionality for manageability, and then above that, you should be able to do, uh, if you're a particular platform, you should be able to do additional stuff. So the baseline, um, so right now there's uh, a baseline profile, which defines exactly what type of capabilities need to be available across uh, OCP platforms. And that's everything from some low-level inventory to the setting of, of IP addresses to resetting the system um, to, in, to inventory. Um, and then uh, if you're a server, there's additional stuff you can do. You can now look at the processors, look at the memory, look at so on and so forth. So um, they're in the process of, of rolling this out. Uh, a baseline exists. The server profile would exist uh, for that to um, exist. And so um, the way the DMTF uh, works is that innovation occurs below the interface. So DMTF doesn't care how it's implemented. So it can be implemented on a BMC, which is a microcontroller on the platform, which is always powered on. So um, the minute you plug in a, a baseboard, the BMC can come up, and it can start listening and helping you uh, provision the system. Um, Refish can be implemented as a software agent, so it can run on top of the OS. Um, it really doesn't matter uh, to, to DMTF, the Redfish is just a RESTful interface for, for accessing manageability. Okay. Uh, second is that within OCP, um, they also have, uh, as I said, they did open hardware. So they started actually doing open hardware. So they have a, uh, they took the BMC and they isolated it onto a module, stuck it on a connector. And so the first version was run BMC. The second version is uh, DCSCM, and that's so uh, as people design motherboards, they no longer have to redesign the BMC and, and do the routing and the placement of it every time that they can just have the connector, plug in the module, and, and be done with it. Um, and so lastly, there's the implementation. So now you have a, you have a piece of hardware, so you got BMC on it. Uh, where do you get the software or the firmware to run on it? Uh, there's OpenBMC, which is a Linux Foundation uh, repository. Um, and so you can, uh, the way they build these now is they have all the remnant BMCs and DCSCM also have a, a have a, a AST 2500 and they all, you can download a BMC, uh, run BMC version on there. Okay. And then um, uh, we work with, uh, DMTF works with run BMC, uh, open BMC to support the Redfish interface. So there's, a, there's kind of a three way uh, uh, alliance there to make sure that um, uh, the Redfish interface has both a way of defining it, OCP will prescribe it as you have to have this uh, subset of functionality, and then OpenBNC will implement it and then run the performance test to make sure that functionality exists. Okay. So, um, uh, the DMTF got, had a uh, alliance partnership with OpenStack at least seven years ago. Um, and so as part of that, um, uh, one thing that, that we talked about, I think, at the Retrofish uh, uh, deep dive was Sushi, which is the um, layer that you put below within Ironic, your Google Talk Run BMC. So that's been ongoing for several years now. Uh, the DMTF actually has a dedicated set of contractors to uh, improve uh, Sushi and expand the functionality of it. So as we add functionality to Redfish, uh, if, if we see that there's a uh, place to insert it within the uh, ironic base, uh, we can go do that. And so the way you read this is that uh, this uh, left-hand side is exactly what's in the ironic base, what it does, and then how much of it actually utilizes um, Sushi and Redfish to actually get to that uh, functionality in the platform. And that's all open source. Just that. So, uh, so summary is that, you know, um, uh, 
basically, Redfish uh, has taken manageability and reduced it to a, to a RESTful interface. So all you need is you need uh, a HTTP path, a URI, and then understanding what the content that's returned. And so um, uh, the content is returned in JSON. Uh, we describe it in, in JSON schema, and we describe it in Open API. So that connects up to those particular tool chains in case you want to auto-generate clients to, to run against the, the interface. And uh, the way um, you do an access is that you just wander down these bubble trees which exist throughout this, the um, um, uh, documentation of going from service root, which is Redfish v1, going to systems, going to the first system uh, that you have. So by looking at the, at the diagram, you can see, you know, if I want to go to the first processor, I can get down there. And it returns a, a JSON packet. And JSON packet is a set of name value pairs. Those name value pairs are all described within the schema um, itself. Okay. So, um, so um, there, there was a uh, Redfish deep dive yesterday. Sorry, you missed it. Um, however, you can engage Redfish. We have a, a public bulletin board, uh, which people ask questions on. So, if you're a newbie, if you're if you're a professional who's who's found problems in it, and you have not, you're not part of DMTF, you can still engage uh, um, the DMTF and we go through the forum on at least a weekly basis. Uh, there's someone actually sitting there, usually uh, responds it fairly quick. And then there's a developer hub where you can wander through uh, mockups of uh, what the Redfish uh, tree looks like uh, for various uh, uh, sets of systems. And I think that's it. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, question? Um, I would, I would, I would have to bring the guy who actually does the implementation of, of that right, right now. Uh, basically, it uses another method other than Redfish to get to that, that functionality. So I believe the functionality exists in Ironic. It just doesn't need to get down to Redfish to, to get that information. Anything else?